There we go. You, as a business owner, hire an individual. You've made a decision to hire an assistant. Is that a business transaction? What? Not until they earn the money. Because until they show up and actually start working for you and earning some salary, it's not really a business transaction. Right? Same with you go and order some supplies or some inventory. You placed an order. Nothing has happened yet. Until you receive those goods or take possession of them, and we'll talk about the timing, nothing has occurred. You don't really have any inventory until you take possession of the inventory. At that point, you've got a new asset, and if you bought it on credit, you have a new liability. So we need to recognize that a transaction has occurred. We need to value it in a standardized unit of measure. For the purposes of this class, it'll be U.S. dollars. You will not always, in real life, transact all of your business in U.S. dollars, especially now with the global economy. We didn't need to classify it. Is this business transaction affecting an asset, an expense, a liability, stockholders' equity, or a revenue? They're different. All right? Those are the transactions that will then affect our financial statements. All right? So recognition. When has it occurred? That is the recognition point. And this can be very, very complicated. The example I use all the time is you go out and buy a new cell phone. You sign a two-year contract with Sprint or Verizon, Verizon or AT&T. What has happened as far as AT&T is concerned? They've got revenues, right? You went and bought a new cell phone. But you only paid $99, or maybe you got it for free. So how do you value it? Something has happened. You walked out of an AT&T store with a new cell phone. That's it. Over the course of the two-year profit, or the two-year contract, that contract that you sign, whatever your monthly bill is going to be, is really split between two revenue streams. One is attributable to the handset that you bought, whether it's an iPhone or whatever. All right? You bought that at a discount because you're going to be paying for the balance of it over the next two years, a piece of that monthly fee. And the other one is cell phone service that they recognize monthly. Yes, sir? So in reality, you're paying for the phone. You're paying for the phone, yeah. Because if you, if you break the contract early, you say, oh, I don't like AT&T. I want to go to Verizon. They're going to charge you the balance of what that phone was worth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's why they lock it also. You can't put another SIM card in the darn thing and use it, even internationally which for me is a big problem. <laughs> you, know. you can after your contract. Yeah, yeah. No, it's free after the two years. Yeah, yeah, because I've got an unlocked uh, 5S, but my new 6 Plus is locked. So I can't use this when I go to Hong Kong and China, but I can use this one, the one I'm recording with. So that's my Chinese phone when I'm not here in the classroom. <laughs> so I put a new SIM card in there. It works like a charm. Hong Kong, Taipei, anywhere I go. All right. But this one, I can't. This one is just locked up. It just does nothing but take text from AT&T customers. <laughs> so and then i got to carry two of the darn things. <laughs> not a big deal. All right, so that's recognition point. And for the most part, here, it'll be straightforward. When to recognize. Valuation. They're valued at the fair value when they occur. So once again, going back to the handset at the cell phone. 
You only paid $99 for that iPhone 5S nowadays. I think that's what they're charging for the old one. But over the two-year contract, what is the true value of that iPhone sale? You've got to take the piece that AT&T is attributing, and I don't know their formula. They're taking a piece of, say, that $50 a month that you're going to pay over the next two years for AT&T service, and then they'll attribute that to the iPhone, the actual handset sale. But then they'll have to do a present value, and we'll talk about present value later in the class, because a dollar today is worth more than a dollar next month, or the month after that, or the month after that, right? We all can agree on that. If you get a birthday card from your grandma and it says, I'm going to give you $100 a year from now, you will all be grossly disappointed when grandma, won't you? Because <laughs> you want the $100 now. Because now you can spend it, now you can pay off debts, in, same in business. It's worth more today than it will be a year from now. You could save it and earn money on it. You had a question. Mm -hmm. so you do that on, stocks. on stocks that you buy as an investment? Yeah. Well, it's, that one's a little tricky because in a business sense, it depends on the management's intent when they buy the stock. You always record them at their historical cost, but as they increase or decrease in value, that is what is known as an unrealized gain or loss. And that varies depending upon management's yeah. intent. Because I was wondering, like, what, if he did have a direct Right. Yeah. And so at the balance sheet date, you always record stocks at their fair market value because they're highly liquid. You know exactly what they're trading at. So you record it, and, but as to whether or not you take that to the income statement or not depends on management's intent. That's a, actually a topic that we cover in intermediate accounting, too. So if you're an accounting major, I'll eventually tell you the answer to that. But for right now, you don't need to really know it. Okay? So fair value, the exchange price of the actual transaction between arm's length, unrelated business partners. The cost principle, this is where the U.S. differs with a lot of the world. Well, really, the rest of the world. Is, is that we record things at cost. The reason for this, it's been an argument amongst U.S. accountants for 80 plus years. The reason we do this is one, it's conservative. Two, it's verifiable. We can verify how much you paid for it. The example I always use in this is that Coca-Cola owns 32 acres in downtown Atlanta, Georgia. A big piece of land worth hundreds of millions of dollars. It's where their headquarters is. They've got a research and development. It's where they lock up the secret formula in a little vault. They bought that land in the late 1800s. It is recorded today on the books at its original cost. <laughs> Whatever it was, yeah, it probably wasn't much. The rest of the world allows businesses to write up to their fair market value fixed assets, buildings, artwork, land, even manufacturing equipment and things. We do not in the United States. We stick with the cost principle. It's a very conservative way. There are extreme examples across the board. Yes, sir? So if they sell that land... If they sell it, they've got a huge gain, yes. <laughs> yeah. how, how many acres did you say? 32 there? acres. That's a lot of, that's a lot of acreage. Is it like a city, though? It's like a well, yeah, but, I mean, it's downtown Atlanta. I mean, the Coca-Cola building is very, very prominent in downtown Atlanta. I mean, so. That's pretty Yeah, it's a big facility. Yeah, it's a lot of, I don't even know what the acreage is here, but I, I don't think this whole campus is much more than 
32 acres. <laughs> so it's a lot of land. Okay. All right. And then we classify it into the appropriate categories or accounts. So that's the three-step process we do as accountants every time a business transaction has occurred. We use a double entry system. For each and every business transaction, there is going to be two accounts that are affected. Every transaction, a minimum of two. They may be more, but at least two. The double entry accounting system was used in businesses dating back to the 1200s. <coughs> 800 plus years ago. It was written in a book of mathematics in the 1400s by a Franciscan monk. It is unchanged for the most part in those 800 years. It's a system that works, which is why we're talking about it now. It is not the easiest system to understand, I will admit up front, because we're going to get it ready to talk about credits and debits. This course at other universities is sometimes taught without using those two words. But you really genuinely cannot function in a business environment in any capacity whether you're in the finance department, the human resources department, the marketing, engineering, operations, supply chain, you cannot truly function in business today without at least a basic understanding of credits and debits, which is why we as the accounting faculty here teach it this way rather than the other way. All right. A T account is a representation of an account. It looks like the letter T. And this is where I'll, the slide defines what is a debit and a credit. And it is nothing more than the left and right side of that account. To try to make to put any more logic or explanation into it will confuse you, trust me. It is simply left and right. The debits are the left side of the equation. The credits are the right. That's it. Left and right. The way I always remembered it from the time that I was sitting in your seat is credit has an R in it. Debit does not. So it worked for me. However you want to do it, you have to remember that it's left and right. In this classroom, debits are towards the window and credits are towards the door. How you remember it beyond that is entirely up to you. Yes, sir. Why does we mean debit going out, credit going in? Nope. Don't, don't, don't go there yet. <laughs> nope. <laughs> it's just left and right. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> it means nothing other than that. I know. It sounds crazy. That God bless you that there's nothing more than that. What happens with debits and credits varies depending upon the type of account. All right? When we do illustrations here on the board, There are in a T, T account, because it's just a representation of what is known as an account ledger, and I'll talk about the difference between a journal and a ledger and a trial balance here in a second. 
at the end of the period, so these are transactions that occurred to cash. Don't worry about what's going on with cash or what these transactions represent. It's just transactions that affected cash. There was some cash coming in, there was some cash going out. At the end of the month, we added up all the debits and all the credits. That's called footing the account. It's just adding up the column. When we take the difference between the two footings, that's the account balance. And there were more debits than there were credits, so it wound up at the end of the period with a debit balance of 15700 Yes, sir? You always subtract the credit from debit? Always subtract the two to get the difference. And then whatever the bigger one, that's the balance. Okay? You're always going to take the difference between the two sides and then record what is the balance. Because there's more debits, 51500 than there were credits, 35800 All right, so you just take the bigger one and put it under that side. And put it on that side, because that's the balance. All right? Is, uh, like, is debit the money coming in and credits and money going out? That, I that is, in fact, what's happening here. But... Give me a second and I'll explain the whole picture. With an asset, which cash is an asset, debits increase assets and credits decrease them. All right? Don't worry about it. it it's going to make sense. I do this twice a year. Trust me, I'm a professional. <laughs> It'll eventually make sense. But we need to take little steps. Yes, sir. Yes. Then you put the balance on the credit side. Exactly. All right. We good so far? Okay. As I said, in the double entry system, every transaction affects two accounts. So here's our accounting equation that we introduced in Chapter 1. Assets equals liabilities plus stockholders' equity. As I said already, assets are increased with debits, so any transaction on the left side increases assets. Well, algebraically, the only way this equation works is if the opposite occurs on this side of the accounting equation. I know, I see the furrowed brow. Give me a second. You're buying some supplies on credit. You ordered some supplies. They've come in to your place of business. You've offloaded them on the loading dock. You now have a box of supplies. You have an accounts payable that you owe the person that you bought the supplies from. You haven't paid for it yet. That's a liability. So what has happened? Supplies has gone up, that's a debit, increasing an asset, and accounts payable, a liability has gone up, that's the credit. That's your transaction. Debit to supplies, credit to accounts payable. Because you owe people for that. It's other people's money, OPM. What if that same transaction occurred where you paid the delivery man the minute they handed you the box? So now what has happened? Still an asset has gone up. You've got, say, $100 worth of supplies in the box. But what's the other side of the transaction? That's the debit. Supplies is the debit. The credit is now to cash because that's what you're spending. And what does that do? It lowers cash. So it didn't affect this side of the equation at all. You had one asset go up, one asset go down. Debit to supplies, credit to cash. See how, why this has worked for 800 plus years? It just works. No, your debits and credits always have to equal. Yep. 
Always. Okay? Add layer complexity to it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but this is all in your book. And this slide right here, which I don't know which one it is, but this slide right here in PowerPoint, if you take it, print it out, cut this off on the bottom and tape it to your bathroom mirror and stare at it every morning, will give you everything you need to know right now. Because what is going on with stockholders equity? Stockholders equity has an account in it called retained earnings. We've already determined that retained earnings go up when you earn revenue. So if stockholders' equity goes up with a credit, revenues must also increase with a credit. Right? If expenses lowers net income and lowers retained earnings, expenses are a negative effect to retained earnings. So how do you lower retained earnings? You do so with debits. So if, if these supplies that we bought were expensed immediately, they're not an asset. At that point, and we're still paying cash, we're going to debit supplies expense that lowers net income, lowers retained earnings. That's our debit, because stockholders' equity goes down with debits. And we credit cash, lowering an asset. So an asset went down, cash, stockholders' equity, retained earnings, net income went down. That's the debit. We're going to do lots and lots of examples of this over the next, well, actually, weeks. But, all right, does this make sense so far? Let's do some examples now. We'll do normal balance here in a second. I talked about this. Stockholders' equity is really broken up between revenue and expenses and dividends. Okay? The accounting cycle. This is month in and month out. Every firm worldwide. Day in and day out, you analyze transactions from source documents. We need proof. Accountants are a very suspicious species. So if you're buying the supplies, you have an invoice for it. You actually have three source documents. Because how does a business order $100 worth of supplies? Well, there's really four. Somebody needed the supplies. They filled out a purchase requisition. Somebody needed them. They sent that to the purchasing department. The purchasing department then issued a purchase order based upon the supplies that somebody needed. Purchase order was sent to the vendor where they traditionally buy their supplies from. That's source document number one, the purchase order, because it tells everyone involved how much we ordered and what price we agreed to pay. All right? The supplies then get shipped to you and they show up at your loading dock. Inside that box of supplies is a packing list. You've all ordered something, right? You got it from Amazon, there's a packing list inside there. The packing list traditionally does not have the price on it. I mean, from Amazon it does, because they're sending it to you. But a normal packing list doesn't have the price. It just has the quantity in the item. And what does the individual at the loading dock do? Anybody ever worked at a loading dock? You sign it, but what are you signing? You're attesting to that you, if there's supposed to be 100 items in the box, by God, there's 100 items in the box. You count what these arrived. 
and you have signed or initialed that in fact you received the items that were supposed to be in the box and that they're in good shape, not all bo broken up or anything like that. Source document number two. At some point in time, the vendor then mails an invoice to your account's payable department. Your account's payable clerk opens that up, goes XYZ office supplies. Ah, I have a purchase order and a packing list from them. I've been expecting this. We received this stuff last week. Match it up. If the price that was agreed upon and the quantities that were ordered and received matched what's being charged on the invoice, it's okay to pay it. That's the three-way match, which is why accounts payable clerks are worth their weight in gold. Because that's what they do day in and day out all the time. And they have to do it. And in reality, they rarely match. You ordered 100, you got 97 because three are on back order. Right? They rarely match. They're worth, they're worth absolutely. And that's all step one. All that that I just told you about. Because the second step is record it by entering it into the general journal. So what will happen at that moment with your accounts payable clerk when they hit enter is, is that you will then debit supplies inventory and credit accounts payable for whatever you agreed to buy the stuff for. That's the second one. Now, computer systems do a lot of this stuff automatically. But even in a manual system, dating back to the 1200s, this is how they were recorded. So some vendor in Italy got something and recorded it as a debit to supplies and a credit to accounts payable. Probably said it in Italian, but the transaction's the same. The next step, you need to post those individuals <laughs> each side of that journal entry to the account ledgers. The account ledgers is what the T account was. So there's a cash account ledger, there's an accounts receivable accounts ledger, there's an inventory accounts ledger, there's a supplies accounts ledger, there's an accounts payable accounts ledger, there's a ledger for everything. How many of you have a checkbook? Most of you? Some of you? You know that check register? that you're supposed to fill out when you write checks? Nobody does. I don't either. Don't feel bad. <laughs> I'm a practicing CPA. I don't fill out my checklist. That's an account ledger. That's the cash ledger for your checking account. As you make deposits into it, you put them in the deposits account. It just happens to be on the left side, which is a debit for your cash account. When you write checks, it says checks. That's the right side. And then there's a balance. So as you make deposits, you increase the balance. And as you write checks, you decrease the balance. That's how you find out whether you have any cash left. In reality, what do you do? You go to the ATM and you do balance inquiry. You go, woo hoo I got $10. Withdrawal. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's what you do nowadays. I do the same thing. I've got an app. I go, no, I have cash. I'll take it. Once you post those journals, you can then, at any point in time, get a balance. How much cash do you have? How much do you have in supplies? How much do you have in accounts receivable? How much do you owe in accounts payable? That's just footing the debits and credits and getting the balance. You then take all of those balances of all the assets, all the liabilities, all the stockholders' equity, all the revenues, all the expenses, and you put them in a trial balance. That's just the month end. That's what was given to you at the end of Chapter 1. 
account balances at the end of, in the painters, Collegiate Painters, Inc., at the end of September 30, 2011. That was really the end of the story. This is the beginning of it. So you take that trial balance, and when we get into chapters 3 and 4, we're going to make some adjusting entries to those, and then we can prepare financial statements. That's the cycle. Month in, month out, year after year after year after year. Okay? All right. This is just an illustration of it. You have a business activity. You've got source documents. You record it in a journal. You take individual pieces of the journal and post them to the ledgers. You get account balances of every ledger account. Take that to a trial balance. Make some adjusting entries. Produce financial statements. And then close out, which I'll talk about later. Give the financial statements to decision makers. They make new decisions for new direction of business activities the following month. That's what it happens. Okay? So, <clears throat> talked about this. All right, let's do some. We're almost done. You're going to start a business. Well, actually, Tony Ross is going to start a business. Creative Designs. She goes up to Austin to the Secretary of State, incorporates Creative Designs into a corporation. She then takes $40,000 of her own money, puts it into a checking account in the name of Creative Designs, Inc., in exchange for all of the common stock, which has a $1 par value. Right now, don't worry about what par value is. Has a transaction occurred? Yes, she took some of her money and turned it into corporate money in exchange for 100% of the ownership of that corporation. From the corporate side, from the books of Creative Designs, Inc., what has happened? An asset has gone up in the form of cash. That's a debit to cash. Stockholders' equity has gone up. should use the other hands. Cash has gone up, stockholders' equity has gone up in the form of common stock. Does the accounting equation balance? Yes. 40,000 of assets equals 40,000 of stockholders' equity. All is right with the accounting world. Next, oh, here's the actual transaction. There's the journal entry. Post it to the cash account and the common stock account. Next, she goes out and rents an office. She pays for the office two months in advance. $1,600 a month for $3,200. What has happened now? Prepaid rent is a prepaid expense. It's actually an asset. All right? She's put a deposit down on this office, in essence. Until she actually occupies the office for an entire month, it's an asset. One asset has gone up, prepaid rent, and another asset has gone down, cash. So now you have two asset accounts. Your cash account, which now has $36,800 in it, and prepaid rent, which has $3,200, for a total of $40,000. The accounting equation still balances. $40,000 and $40,000. Here's the entry. One asset went up. Prepaid rent, one asset went down.
it will benefit the operation. It doesn't affect anything, the equation, the total assets, liabilities, because it's one asset for the other. We ordered some office supplies. We've now received those office supplies. $5,200 worth. Another asset, office supplies. You got a whole closet full of them now. You paid for them by promising the office supply company to pay them in the future. On credit, OPM, other people's money. So now, an asset has gone up, $5,200 debit to office supplies, and a liability has gone up. So now, in total, we have $45,200 in assets and $45,200 in liabilities plus stockholders' equity. The accounting equation still balances at all times. It's one of the things that I found most appealing about accounting is, is that at the end of your midterm, you will know, you will have a really good idea as to whether you did it right. Because the balance sheet will balance. Now the terrifying alternative is, is that you're going to get to the end of the balance sheet and it's going to what? It's not going to balance. At which point you're 100% guaranteed that you have made a mistake somewhere. Okay? All right, here's the entry for that. Office supplies, accounts payable. So now we've got three types of assets. We have some cash, we have some prepaid rent, and we have some office supplies. We have one stockholder's equity account, common stock, and we have one liability, accounts payable. We bought some equipment. Uh, here's a good one. We paid $13,320 down in cash, and we agreed to pay the balance next month. So we have a new asset, equipment, whatever it is, of $16,300. One asset, cash, has gone down by $13,320. And the remaining $3,000 is an accounts payable, just like the way we bought our supplies, that we owe these people at the beginning or sometime next month. So a liability has gone up. Exactly. So this is a three-account transaction. Yes, sir. Yes, and what will go down along with the liability? Cash, because the only way you pay a bill is with cash. Well, technically you can pay your visa with your MasterCard, but let's not go there. It's bad practice. Don't, I didn't say that. <laughs> okay, but you can do it. All right, so here's our new transaction. We've got a new asset. Cash went down for the 13320 and a liability went up. Still... Everything balances. We now pay a little bit on the office supplies that we bought. Remember, we bought $5,200 in office supplies back on July 5th. We're going to pay half of it, $2,600. Liability is going down. That's the transaction that we just talked about. And cash goes down. So liabilities go down, asset goes down. Here's the transaction for that. And so you can see now the accounts payable and the cash account is starting to look a little complicated. Because we're posting these journal entries as the transactions occur. Finally, 10 days into this corporation's business, we finally do some work. We design some brochures for a client of ours and they pay us in cash. 
So a debit to cash, the asset is going up. Where's the credit? Which one? No, not supplies. This is, this is revenue. It will eventually be go into stockholders' equity because it will increase net income. Net income will increase retained earnings. This is revenue. So revenue goes up. That's the credit. All right? So the transaction is a debit to cash and a credit to design revenue, which is a stockholder's equity style account. So it goes up with credits. So it will be on the right side. Revenue will be on the correct. Side. Absolutely correct. See, isn't this fun? Yes, sir. Uh, but what about the equipment for sixteen thousand? Yep. Uh, so when you spent the thirteen thousand in cash, the cash went down, but the equipment, the asset of the equipment went up. Went up, and then the to balance it. So in net, assets went up by three thousand dollars because you had a new asset for sixteen thousand three twenty. An old asset, cash, went down by thirteen thousand three twenty. So in total, the asset side of the accounting equation went up by three grand net. And that's the accounts payable part, because so, the accounts payable went up by three thousand. Okay, and then uh, the, li the liabilities go up as well. Yes, that's the accounts payable. Okay, so when you when you order the equipment for sixteen thousand, right? All that sixteen thousand goes under assets. Right, when you received it, yeah. Because Yep, because now you have a new asset. You got equipment. You own it. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. So, new revenue. We're going to design a commercial building. We build the fee now. We designed a TV commercial for another client, but this one didn't pay us in cash. They promised to pay us in the future, just like we promised to pay the supplies in the future, and we promised to pay the $3,000 on the equipment that we bought in the future. Once again, now we have a new asset, accounts receivable. This is a promise from our customers to us that they will pay us. So an asset goes up, 9600 The credit, just the same as when they paid us cash for the brochure. The credit is to design revenue a stockholder's equity account, increasing retained earnings on the stockholder's equity side. Yes, sir? I said it promised to pay you, but for the future they can't. We've got a whole different chapter on that. That's where we will calculate sometime after midterm number two what is known as bad debts. <laughs> and trust me, if you sell things on a promise, eventually someone is not going to pay you. That'll be in the future. Don't worry about that now. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so we'll, we'll okay. Okay. We're almost finished. We've got a couple more transactions, and then we're done. All right? Now we're going to design a new series of brochures for another customer. However, they're paying us a retainer, a deposit up. We have not done any work on these brochures yet. So we have not earned any revenue. So now what is happening is cash is going up, all right, because we're receiving $1,400, but a liability, because we, if we never do the work on the brochures, we've got to give this $1,400 back to our client. So a liability called unearned design revenue. This is the way the airline business works. I spent the vast majority of my 25 years professionally in the aerospace business, including working for an airline at one point in time. When you go and buy a ticket, what happens? Do you just tell them, listen, Southwest, I want to fly to Phoenix February 12th. And they go, okay, great. We believe you. Right? That's not how it works, right? They go, okay, what credit card do you want to use? You pay them in advance. 
Now, they haven't earned any revenue yet because they have not taken you to Phoenix. So they owe you that money until you get on to that crazy aluminum cylinder and go up to 30-some-odd thousand feet and go screaming through the atmosphere, and you arrive in Phoenix. And at that point, they don't owe you that money, and they can claim the revenue. Same with the brochure here. It's just a deposit in advance. So if you don't get on the plane, you have to give the money back? Yeah, they've got rules now. They'll probably let you use that sometime in the next year, and they probably charge you $100 because you're changing the ticket. But, yeah, if you buy a fully refundable ticket, yes, and you cancel that flight, they give 100% of it back to you. Yeah. Would the same thing work when you like, order, order something online? In, take until it shows up, yes. They've, collect, they've charged your credit card the minute you hit submit for the order, but if it never shows up, they owe you a refund. If, you know, they say, oh, sorry, we ran out of that. We don't have them anymore. Do you want this one instead? And you go, no. I want the green tennis shoes, not the pink ones. <laughs> you know? Well, maybe you want the pink ones. I don't know. <laughs> so you've got the right to cancel that order. Yes, sir. That is what tells you that that's a liability, not a revenue. So when you see that on a trial balance and you're doing a set of financial statements, you know that that goes in the liability section of the balance sheet and not to the revenue section of the income statement because it's, it's unearned. Okay? So there's that transaction. Back when we did the uh, build the customer for the TV commercial, they're now a partial payment on the accounts receivable. So this is an asset, cash goes up. An asset, accounts receivable goes down. Let's just get through this real quick. Paid our employees. The month end came around. Now we're paying everybody. This is an expense. Wage expense reduces net income, reduces retained earnings, reduces stockholders' equity. It is also reducing an asset, cash. So here's that transaction. We received a bill from CPS for our utilities, our electricity. It's electricity that we use during the month, but we haven't paid it yet. So, once again, a debit to utilities expense, which is a negative retained earnings, negative stockholders' equity, only now we're increasing accounts payable because we owe CPS two weeks from now or what, however long they give us to pay it. Lastly, we declare a dividend to ourselves. You already know from the statement of retained earnings, dividends reduce retained earnings. They operate exactly like expenses. They reduce stockholders' equity. But they just go on the statement of retained earnings, not the income statement. Yes, sir. And dividends are money you pay to the stockholders? To the stockholders. They are, the, in essence, the equivalent of salaries and wages that you pay to your employees. Okay. Right? So here's all of the transactions and all of the accounts. So on the asset side, we have cash that now has a 22,480 debit balance. We have accounts receivable, 4,600, office supplies, prepaid rent, and office equipment. Total, 51,800. Liabilities, we only have two. We have accounts payable that has a credit balance of 6280 We still have the unearned design revenue, 1400 And in stockholders' equity, we have the common stock with a balance of $40,000. we got dividends of 2800 debit. Design revenue of 12400 Wages and utilities. Total stockholders' equity, 44120 Total liabilities, 7680 Add those two together, and it equals 51,800 assets. 
Yes, sir. What's it called when they leave the stock or the money in the company again? Retained earnings. Okay? So we'll do.